Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. The time is three o'clock in Brussels, where I am right now, and it's time to start our webinar. Uh, yes, before we go to the presentation itself, I want to say a couple of words uh, set in the scene. I would take an opportunity to edit, advertise some events organized by ICTCT. Uh, so I hope you are aware about the traditional ICTCT annual conference, which will be uh, in The Hague in the Netherlands in mid-October. Submission is still open until the end of April. And also I can uh, maybe uh, already now tell you that we plan to extend the deadline for another two weeks, so mid-May. Uh, then also in connection to that conference, we will have a traffic safety researchers course, again, a very traditional event, quite well appreciated, quite well attended. So if you have, if you are a PhD student or if you are more senior researcher and have PhD students, uh, under your supervision, please recommend, because it's a very high level, very multidisciplinary course to give very solid uh, background uh, for doing research in traffic safety. Also, uh, uh, AfroSafe Academy is a relatively newly started uh, subcommittee of the ICTCT, uh, but very active one. So uh, there are quite many webinars happening there, uh, and also a conference is organized in June uh, in Tanzania. So submission is closed already, I think. Uh, but uh, still, quite many of those webinars, of those talks, are relevant not only for Africa, but for traffic safety researchers in general. And yet another subcommittee. So you see, ICTCT is really a kind of association with many parallel tracks. So another subcommittee is called Nordic Traffic Safety Academy. Uh, and uh, a traditional event for NTSA is a research school, which uh, this year it will be hosted by Lund University, where I'm coming from. And the topic is about uh, pedestrians and also pedestrians in a more wide concept. So it's not only safety, uh, but also sustainability, working as a transport mode and where we can see synergies uh, and sometimes we can see conflicts. We want more walking, but we don't want more pedestrian accidents. So how to address that issue? Yes. And now, oh yes, and another webinar, which is already scheduled uh, in November with Therese Steinbergen. I hope I pronounced it correctly, from uh, KU Leuven in Belgium in November. Uh, registration is open. Yeah, and as you see, many things are happening at ICTCT. So please stay tuned, visit our webpage, and also sign up for our updates. Good. And now back to the today's talk. Today we have Dick Devard uh, from University of Groningen as the speaker. And uh, Dick is professor in psychology and he's been around for quite a while, has lots of experience. And what I've learned, Dick is very much interested in cyclist and cycling behavior as a special topic, special area. So, Dick, I suggest you take over now. Thanks very much, Alexei. I um, need to share my the correct screen, of course. So, good afternoon to all. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for uh, still being around on a Friday afternoon. Um, when Alexei asked me, he sort of asked me, to give my my 
long-term vis uh, vision on traffic safety or as, as we've heard in the other talks and uh, I was thinking okay can I do that but uh, then the last presentation was by Divera Twisk and she was already talking about uh, uh, bicycles I thought oh maybe I should do something different and look a bit back on what uh, what we've done the past well say 30 years so for for some this will be a walk down to uh, walk down memory lane and for the, the younger ones uh, they may feel very sorry for me for all the difficult times they may have had with um, the equipment that was available but I thought it would be nice to have an overview of things we've done and uh, the idea came when I encountered this envelope it was an envelope from the traffic research center and it made me think well when we used to do questionnaires we used to send a pile of paper through the post and then hoping it would come back uh, in an envelope and then a closed envelope uh, that had a, uh, in general, a postal reply number on it. So a very boring envelope. And I had a colleague at the Traffic Research Center, Rudy de Bruin, who uh, did something that most people who commission a study would probably not be that happy with, but he did a small experiment. Uh, so half of the envelopes he had the postal reply number on, and on the other half he had a uh, a nice stamp, just to see if that would increase response. And uh, well, I can tell you, it did increase response. Uh, people with a stamp on the envelope returned the questionnaire more often. And of course, we don't. Well, we hardly use envelopes anymore in our studies. We uh, prefer to do stuff online, which has. Lots of advantages, of course, uh, if only uh, entering errors that can be made if you if you have to type from uh, from answers from a paper, uh, paper questionnaire. So I thought, well, I'll give an overview of some of the things that struck me. So some of the tools that we've used, there will be uh, quite some vehicles and simulators here that, that I will show some of the instruments that we have. Uh, had available and that we are still some that we are using or are still using. I would like to say a little bit about measures, uh, the standard measure for assessing driving behavior and also cycling behavior, SDLP, so lane control, but also a little bit about higher level measures. And the, the picture you see here is uh, what used to be the traffic research center in the, the village of Haren, south of Groningen where uh, the, the traffic research center was located from the outside, a really beautiful building from the inside. Well, it, quite, it needed quite some maintenance. It's no longer in the possession of the university, but this is where we were located in a very stimulating and nice environment. And the TRC was founded in the, the previous century in 1977 by John Michon. And I said, I'll, I will not talk, I will, will not cover everything, but I'd like to say a few things about, uh, uh, in particular, car driving and, and cycling. Those are the things that I will focus on. Um, so in road safety behavioral research, what we used to do a lot in the 80s and 90s is just go out on the road. So we had our instrumented vehicle to do that. Uh, we had more than one vehicle that was, uh, uh, well, a station car full with equipment and we would enter public roads and uh, drive amongst other road users which has its pros and cons and on the one hand it's as close as to reality as you can get because you simply go outside on the road but you can see here also there's a lorry driving in front of this car uh, well sometimes you go faster and then you have to overtake so the, the, the situation is far from standardized, standardized. Uh, the nice thing is we had a blue car, so um, a blue Volvo, and uh, yeah, well, many, and on top here, there was the, the lane tracker, the, one of the central instruments pointing towards the, uh, the center line to give information about lane position. And as I said, the blue car was also a bit annoying because many people thought this, uh, this was a police car. The police also like to have blue cars. And then with this uh, well, very visible camera on top. Uh, sometimes we had some odd behavior around us. So the vehicle was, was equipped with, with lots of computers and uh, and the camera, well, actually 
the picture should be flipped because it was pointing towards the center line, was covering a, a central area and giving information about position on the road. So this was, uh, yeah, don't laugh. This was the equipment we had, uh, uh, the floppies uh, bigger than your hand uh, that could contain, well, not that much information, but it all worked. And it was, of course, uh, not always easy to have uh, to write on these floppy disk if, if you were on a, a bumpy road. You also see a tape recorder and uh, even a, a paper output here. So I uh, spent quite some time looking at this equipment on the, the back seat while the participants was driving uh, the vehicle. And in general, we had uh, also a uh, driving instructor sitting next to them to take care of... Uh, safety so they could always intervene and take over control uh, many of the first studies performed focused on the effects of uh, medicinal drugs on driving performance and uh, jim o'hanlon was one of the first who found out uh, that well there was a major effect on lane control and in particular on on swerving behavior so on sdlp we found that for diazepam and published that in science so this became the central measure for driving uh, performance. And to give an example of one of the, the, the trips on the road, on the top you see a control placebo condition that we always had, and below that there's a drug condition. Uh, this is just a printout of the lateral control, so the lane control, the variation. We gave them very strict instructions, so they had to drive in the center of the road with the speed of... Uh, 90 kilometers per hour, 90 because then you uh, uh, the, the speed limit was 100, then you wouldn't have to overtake too many vehicles. And keeping constant speed is also something that is well, maybe not the most natural task, but something that you can do in traffic. And it's what we asked from our participants. And as you can see, it's fairly stable here. Uh, the, the lane position also nicely between the lines. But in the drug condition, uh, I don't know which drug this was, but this this is one of the drugs that did have a, a rather, I think one of the hypnotics, because it is a morning test. Um, and as you can see that uh, the, the lane position varies a lot, even driving outside of the lane. And at this position, the uh, driving instructor took over control and stopped the car and drove the participant back. So you see a lot of variation in, in lateral position, but also in speed. It's also more difficult to keep a constant speed. So this was our sensitive measure. And we did a lot of these studies for the pharmaceutical industry uh, because they, they would like to have drugs on the market that had no effect on uh, driving behavior. So they could get rid of the little sticker that prevented uh, driving after having used these drugs. So uh, determined drug, drug impairment. So one of the things we did is uh, test whether the effects differed from placebo, so whether there was an increase uh, compared to placebo in swerving in particular. Uh, but what we also did is to compare effects to a benchmark drug, and for that we used alcohol. And this is still done a lot. Uh, it's not always valid to do it that way because the effects of alcohol and drugs can vary, uh, of course, uh, Alcohol is a sedative, so it may have different effects. But on the outside, if you look at behavior, you, you, it is good to compare uh, lane control with these. And the reason for this is, is what, what Borkenstein uh, found the, in his, his Grand Rapids study, that, that there was a real uh, increase in uh, accidents after 0.05. So there was a clear relationship between blood alcohol level and accident risk. And remarkable enough, if you look at the relationship between uh, blood alcohol level and standard deviation of the lateral position, so swerving behavior, you see a very similar curve here. And this is also the reason why in most countries we, we put the limit at 0.5 pro mil, uh, because after that you see a clear increase. So, 
as an example of these tests, so what is uh, displayed here is the, the change in SDLP, so the, the increase in, in swerving behavior after uh, use of hypnotics. And then there were two tests. So the hypnotics were taken in the evening, uh, sleeping medication. And then uh, in the morning, two rides, uh, a ride was made and also in the afternoon. So there you are all 16, 17 hours after intake. And I'm just using this as an illustration to show that the differences between these uh, hypnotics were enormous. There were uh, some of these drugs would have still an effect comparable to, to 0.8 per mil uh, after 16 hours uh, after intake, while others, more on the left-hand side, uh, did not have these effects. So if you had to drive a car, of course, these left-hand uh, medica uh, medication is far to be preferred over the other ones. Um, well, the last one of the last studies we participated in, uh, I have to say that, that this type of drug research uh, still happens a lot in Maastricht. Um, uh, Jim O'Hanlon moved to Maastricht and continued his, his, uh, his work on this there. Uh, they don't have this, this lane tracker anymore in the, in the format of a camera, but, but they have this sort of, it, it looks a bit like a plumber. So they, they don't use, as in modern cars, the uh, windscreen camera but they still have a more accurate way of assessing this by this tube on the, on the top. And uh, together with uh, Maastricht and Utrecht, we performed a study uh, also using these instrumented vehicles maybe six, seven years ago on uh, the, the effects of uh, uh, different drugs, anxiolytics and hypnotics uh, of longer term users. So the, the problem is there's always a reason to use medication, of course, and people use it for a longer time. And as, as you see, many, many studies were performed on acute effects with healthy participants, but those are not people who need medication. Uh, it, it is people who, who, have, who suffer from, from, uh, uh, from something and for that reason take drugs. Uh, so we, we looked at these groups and tested the longer term effects. And you, you will see that these effects are indeed different from the acute effects. So still studies performed this way. So what we also did in, at the end of the 90s when, when there was GPS, of course, but the, the Americans jammed their system a lot, so it wasn't very accurate. Um, nowadays, you, you wouldn't think of it, but uh, we we traded in our Volvo for a more compact car. You have to imagine that for some people it was quite a, a large vehicle to drive, so a more uh, uh, common car we had for that, uh, Renault. And we did a study on ISA, ISA, so intelligence speed adaptation. And uh, what you see here is the version where they got feedback in the vehicle. So the speed limit was displayed here this way. And depending on the speed they were driving, the color changed from, from green to amber to uh, red. Uh, and red, it was if you were driving 10% over the limit. But of course, we had to get this information into the vehicle. And for that, we ha actually had to, to attach tags to uh, traffic signs. And the moment you pass them, they were picked up by, this, uh, by these antennas. So uh, this is how we did studies in the, in the 90s. We also did other studies in our vehicle, so we had the idea that, uh, well, maybe if people are very tense, they may grab the steering wheel in a more tense way. So we had a steering wheel sensor uh, and tested that. And uh, yeah, well, it uh, correlated in particular well with road curvature, I have to say, not so much with, uh, with stress. But it was very nice. And you can also see that this is from a long time ago because there's not even an airbag in this uh, steering wheel. Other studies that we did, so uh, uh, touch, uh, we had a touch screen, very modern, of course, attached next to the driver. And um, dual task, uh, dual tasking were things we tested, divided attention. And for that, we, we love to use the, uh, the arrows task that was uh, developed in the Haste project, uh, where, where arrows are depicted. And if there's an arrow pointing upwards, you had to press yes. And if uh, there was none, yeah, you have to press no, 
and depending on uh, how how complex the the uh, configuration was, it is easier or more difficult to, to uh, detect whether there's a uh, narrow pointing up or not. If they are all pointing in the same direction, it's a lot easier to track. Still a very nice task uh, to perform. And we, of course, we did it on the roads. So uh, this is me in my younger years, again, sitting in the back seat. Uh, you can see we also had uh, dual controls and, uh, well, uh, of course, computers where we, we stored stuff. And uh, it fitted in this car. It, uh, we needed less space compared to the, the first uh, version anyway. Um, yeah, European projects. Uh, Alexa, you are at the European project now. So uh, this was one of the things we always had in projects: instrumented cars, uh, for the uh, specifically developed for the project. So this one uh, was about uh, monitoring uh, wakefulness of the driver, the driver drowsiness monitoring, uh, and, uh, with with cameras. Uh, well. It, it, the, I, I still think that the commission liked it a lot. It, we, it, it had something touchable, something that you could demonstrate uh, and show to them. And uh, yeah, my my absolute favorite favorite, and the commissions also is this one. Of course, we had Ferrari as a partner. <laughs> There's only one guy allowed to drive it. Uh, they don't uh, give you. Uh, access to that. Even the uh, one of the employees of Ferrari was not allowed to drive it. But this was a uh, a project where we adapted the environment to the driver to make it, to make it as comfortable as, as possible for them, uh, depending on their mood. So you, they, they would play, could play different music and uh, we measured heart rate and everything uh, and, and position in, 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 the, in the chair to see uh, whether we should change stuff to make it more comfortable. This I encountered, uh, and I, I really have to show it, it, it is one of the, the, the first studies I uh, participated in. You can hardly imagine it, but uh, this is uh, by the ministry, by Rex Waterstaat. They had a via scope, a wire scoop. So uh, uh, what is it? Well, it's just a uh, rebuilt miniature road with... Uh, uh, the vehicles and the camera. This is a camera, and this is the view that you would get if you would would drive there. So you would drive in this environment, uh, and this is the environment that we tested, and we also compared it to an environment out on the road where they were interested in, okay, well, we have this noise barrier here that sort of approaches the road. So will people get scared and stay away from it? So will they move their lateral position? And they could operate the camera here in the via scope by uh, well, by this interface. <clears throat> um, uh, very very strange because the cars are of course not moving, and uh, but still you would get the impression of being on that road. If we looked at subjective measures, so how they experienced the environment, it was very similar to the effects we found on the road. If we look at actual vehicle controls, so for instance position on the road. In the in the uh, miniature world, we did not find an effect there. While in the the real world, we did find a sort of evading effect of this uh, noise barrier. Of course, we we moved uh, to simulators. We all do studies in simulators nowadays. This was our our first simulator with a with a big silicon graphics computer and a big BMW. I have to say. Um, uh, with, with large projection screens, very well, square buildings and cars, but that didn't matter because the behavior of the cars was very natural, and that is what you perceive while driving there. And this is a picture I took two weeks ago because they actually have our simulator in the university museum now. So how about that? Um, uh, of course, there are institutes that do better than us, have more money, and of course, I'm very jealous about them. Uh, and uh, BGI, this is even number four of them, or ITS Leeds, they have these ground uh, simulators, moving base. Uh, still, I like to find comfort then in this sort of uh, publications that it's not always necessary to have the biggest and largest and most expensive uh, simulator to perform valid studies. Just wanted to show that. So this is what we got later in the in two thousand six, uh, a lot cheaper, 
screens around it. Uh, we needed a screen behind the, the drive because we were studying merging behavior. Uh, worked quite well, I have to say. Uh, later, we added a uh, little moving platform. And uh, Alessandra, sorry, I, uh, I'm showing your picture. I, I saw you were on the list. I yes. hope it's okay with you. <laughs> No GPRS uh, here that I asked yeah. you, but I, I think it's a nice picture because it also shows uh, the uh, uh, the cyclist uh, uh, that we have in our, our simulator. So we have a small moving based platform that, that gives the sensation, in particular if you brake, it's very important uh, that you have, get a sensation of, uh, of braking because yeah, your eyes tell you a different story than your, your belly, I would almost say. And this, uh, as uh, Divera said, that she was uh, a bit uh, uh, disappointed by cyclists in in uh, simulated environments. I think our sim our cyclists are quite nice in in the simulator. So I so that show you that. Well, as a bridge to cycling, uh, we do a lot of studies. Still do a lot of studies with with uh, on on cycling, uh, but also in the uh, previous century we had these big cameras mounted on a on a uh, bike following other vehicles and just observing how they would behave. What we still do, what we have done and still do is make use of uh, action cameras. They're relatively cheap, they're not so conspicuous. So it's, uh, uh, if, you, if you enter traffic, not everybody is pointing at you, uh, Ooh, what's that? But it's clear that they are, um, uh, but they do give you a lot of information. So they give you visual information, they give you, they have GPS, they have information about location and speed also. And this is uh, the latest, what we've been working on. This is our bicycle simulator uh, being developed in uh, Delft right now. We'll move to our institute uh, in uh, June. And the nice thing about this simulator is that it can lean. It is uh, still the first version, so a lot has to be improved, but I'm very optimistic that we will have a, a very special bicycle simulator soon. A little bit about measures. Um, so yeah, the, the ultimate measure um, is, of course, whether you get an accident or not. Or, of course, I should say crashes because, well, Accident is the way we talk about it, right? Nobody wants to have an accident anyway. But the ultimate safety measure is accidents. And the, the funny thing is, what I find remarkable is that what you see in, in simulated studies that they sometimes count the number of crashes. So if the, the driver crashed the vehicle, this is taken from a publication. If it crashed more than twice, they were told they would lose their particip participation payment. I, in general, don't tend to try to crash twice when when driving home or doing something. So I, I think this is something we should avoid in uh, in simulated studies. You don't want to have crashes there, and it also happens uh, in in pedestrian studies. So collision a, a crossing was scored as a collision when the participant was virtually hit by an, by the approaching. You don't want that, right? Even in a simulator, you don't want it. Uh, so I think this should be avoided. So. It's better to take proxy measures of that. And in, in uh, on-road driving tests, we have uh, two standard uh, measures that we, uh, that we always take, so the road tracking test and, and the car following test. Uh, the first one developed by O'Hanlon focused on SDLP and car following on, well, what I will explain in a second. So you have the road tracking test and these are nice pictures developed by the University of Maastricht. I have to give credits for it, so you have the the uh, control condition where people swerve, uh, but in general remain between the lines. And then for instance, an alcohol condition where they swerve a lot more. And well, based on the, the, the deviation from the central position, you get as SDLP as central measure. And this is a safety measure because if you swerve out of lane, of course you have a risk of hitting a car in the other lane. But these are uh, actually it's strange that SDLP is such a sensitive measure in all these studies because it, it's very automated behavior that we have. So apparently there's also a higher level control uh, influence on this. Uh, but it's still, it's, it's used a lot, SDLP. But it is, it is mainly here on, uh, on 
control skill level. And the other way is your speed, standard deviation speed, also control level. But what is interesting is to look at higher level measures. So the, the, the maneuvering level measures. And one of the tasks developed is the car following task where we, we look at how well people are capable of following speed changes of a lead car. And I will say a bit about gap acceptance also. So the car following, we performed this on the road also in the beginning. We had two instrumented vehicles and the lead car would vary their speed uh, according to a certain pattern. And then the, 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 the other car had to follow at a safe uh, but constant distance. That was the instructions we gave. And this is what you get then. So you have a lead car and then and, uh, and then a following car with a little bit of delay. So uh, because you need to perceive what's happening. And some measures come out. I don't want to go into this too deeply, but you have, as uh, I said, a, a lead car changing speed and the following car following that speed. And uh, oops, the wrong button. Um, different measures that come out of it. Well, the, the, the first one is coherence. So how similar are the speeds? Are they followed in a similar pattern? Yes or no? Which is a, a condition, of course. And then the main measure is the the phase delay, so how much time does it take to respond to changes? And then there's also gain, the amount of overshoot that you have here. And in these studies, we, we found some, some nice effects. Uh, also in alcohol, for instance, an increased delay with a more elegant continuous measure. So that is uh, road tracking, car following. Uh, what is nice about simulators is that you can also do uh, do more. You can have uh, interaction with with other uh, participants. So uh, uh, my favorite is still the gap acceptance task where you uh, need to take a turn and there's traffic coming, for instance, from the opposite side and the gap between these vehicles is varied. And at a certain moment, people accept the gap. So they, they go and then you can uh, assess which gap size they accepted but also how critical the situation was, so how closely were they approached by the, uh, by the vehicle, so how, how, yeah, how critical did it, was it? So, and th this is a study from, uh, from uh, a study we, we did, an example from a study we did uh, with illegal drugs, this was an M MDMA and a combination of, of drugs that people had taken, and here they also had to take a turn, and what was nice there, so yeah, they, they had taken ecstasy, uh, MDMA, what you see is that uh, there was not so much an effect on swerving behavior on SELP, but there was a, a, a clear effect on the gap to acceptance and the effect of ecstasy, a stimulant drug. What you would expect also is that they uh, accept smaller gaps, and that is exactly what you saw. So people take more risks after taking these drugs. One thing about, yeah, how valid are the simulators? Well, this is still a good example, I think. Uh, what, we, what we often find, so in within studies, it's absolutely fine to, to use uh, simulators. But if you're looking at absolute levels, there may be a difference. difference. So there is a relative uh, validity, but not uh, absolute uh, validity. Um, yeah, well, the, just to demonstrate how things have changed. We were very proud on our first eye movement uh, equipment, the NAC5. We even put people in, in this uh, uh, big Volvo with it and assessed the behavior there on the road. Uh, but as you all know, it, it's very, very laborsome to, to uh, analyze uh, eye movement. Oh, there are some well, automated routines available now, nowadays, but in those days, it was very, very labels. But it was an eye-opener, literally, for us to see where people were looking while driving. Talking about tools, sometimes we use very simple tools. I, I love the dash cam, in particular this one with two cameras on it. Uh, so you have an image of the driver, but also what's happening outside. And we also do studies with, with students with it. And one of the, the first studies we did was this. So we had people drive alone. So they were driving in their own car, which is a big advantage. So they had a TomTom -tom navigation device and uh, they were driving and they would come back and then they, they we, would, we could see uh, what had happened during their rides. And uh, yeah, 
Well, this this was rather unexpected uh, for me also, in particular because when this person returned, they didn't say anything about uh, this uh, minor collision. There was no real harm done, but uh, it did get very realistic, I think. What we've done uh, more recently is another thing that I find very interesting, but these same cameras, and this is how people interact. So when people grow older, what you see very often is an older couple, and then uh, they drive together in a complementary way. So uh, in general, uh, the, the guy is, is still the person who has the driving license, but uh, their partner is helping along. So if they encounter a difficult intersection, uh, they help and say, okay, yeah, yeah, you can go now or not. Or sometimes they quarrel, can be very interesting, very nice type of studies. How much time do I have left? Uh, not, not that much, right? Yeah, five, 10 minutes still okay. Five, 10 minutes, okay. Well, the, at what I, uh, the Wizard of Oz is also a lovely, I'm not gonna talk about that then. I wanna say a little bit about cycling. Uh, uh, of course, the NS1 studies I adore. We had Ian Walker, who did all these studies on his own, measuring how 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 much distance uh, cars kept when overtaking them. Uh, we have uh, Marco, of course, cycling on his own with his fully equipped uh, uh, bicycle from Göteborg um, to uh, uh, Bologna. Uh, and it's, it is nice. There are so many tools. We like to use these cameras. Uh, I always show this picture because everybody's looking at, at this lady's skirt, but it's all about the camera that is as good as invisible here. And that is as sad the way I would like people to be in traffic. And you can measure so many things. So you have uh, a, a speed pattern here. You can jump to locations. You have a map here where they were and the speed and etc. And you can also measure uh, lateral position if you uh, if you do it in a, in a proper way. So one of the things that uh, Frank uh, Westerhuis and I found out is when uh, uh, what's, what are critical situations, you, you don't want to wait for crashes. So this is one of, one of the times that people were cycling on their own. And as you can see, they, they quickly, briefly entered the verge. So uh, here it's okay, but if you have a, 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 a verge that is not level, this is a typical location where accidents can happen. But we, we found quite some information from this type of studies. And we called it naturalistic cycling. So people were uh, just cycling everyday routes on their own bicycle. They kept a simple diary. We had the cameras with video and GPS. And we explored the, the difficulties in, in infrastructure and potentially dangerous behavior with simple tools. And well, in the past, we used to measure uh, lane positions, some of it also in, in experimental setups with, with one or two of these cameras. And then we would have an overlay and then uh, assess how far they would stay away from, from the verge. Also done a lot of studies on dual task performance, and this is something I really want to show because I think here things have changed. When it was still allowed, we did uh, studies on, on uh, operating a mobile phone while cycling, texting, even gaming. We had to do it on a quiet uh, cycle path. Um, here, quite isolated, as you can see, he's carrying a phone and had to send a text message. But the way we did it in the beginning, how we, how we uh, measured this, how we assessed it, was by a simple, well, sort of strips that we counted how often they changed lane here. As you can see, he is, well, not that stable while operating his phone. And later we found out, well, there is, there came more and more, uh, uh, there came more, more and more software. There's more and more software available that helps you. So we found out that Kinovea, which is actually meant for sports, for analyzing how people throw balls, can also be used to, for instance, to to track how people move in a certain area and you get as an output a, a lane position here. Very nice. And now uh, my, one of my uh, PhDs, Bastian Sporl, de developed another system where he actually takes strips of video footage and then you get uh, a, a line here 
that indicates how people are swerving. So these, these things are more and more automated and more and more easy uh, to analyze and give you more and more accurate information, definitely compared to the strip example that I gave. So, yeah, um, uh, we do a lot of studies still with uh, uh, cameras. Sometimes we instrument also the, the bicycle of the experimenter. So you have the footage from the lead, uh, the lead cyclist the participant, but also from the following cyclist. So you have a lot of information there. And I'd like to uh, finish with uh, some footage from uh, an international student who was being followed on an experiment and just to demonstrate how they cycled. So some people ask me whether people behave naturally in our studies if they can participate while he is taking a roundabout in the opposite direction and cycling on the, the uh, left-hand side. In the Netherlands, we tend to do it on the right-hand side. And uh, yeah, well, by this moment, we thought this is uh, uh, far enough now we, we should intervene and send him to the other side of the of the road. I think this is what I what I wanted to show, and I want to say a big big thank you to all the people that that uh, I've worked with and that helped to make all these studies possible. I tried to find some pictures from the past from them, and uh, we'll show that here. And perhaps Alexa, if you allow me, this is this is it. You. There might be questions. Should I stop sharing my screen? Is that the idea? Yes, you can do that. So thank you very much, Dick. It's very uh, interesting. Also, a little bit funny looking at all those like old equipments, but also also uh, very exciting. I mean, people have been thinking about smart questions a long time ago. Um, so now procedure is like that. It's a regular Zoom meeting. So basically people can talk, but we need some order in that. So I would suggest if you have a question, please just write down your name in chat and I will call you out in that order. Uh, and while we are waiting for the first person to do that, I will ask my question to you, Dick. Ah, privilege of you, yeah. Uh, so it was interesting to see the evolution of the technical part of the equipment, uh, but I want you to reflect a little bit, like first, has there been an evolution in ethical assessment of what you are doing? Because what you showed from 80s, well, people under medications uh, driving quite unsafe, I would say. Uh, so your reflections on that. And the second one. Do you see any change in types of research questions, like what you are studying in 80s, 90s, and what is more on the agenda now? So the first one, definitely, yes, ethics. Uh, we were very aware of ethics. There was an ethical committee for the drug studies also. It is not that we just did what we wanted to do, but uh, the way I started, for instance, with the envelope, uh, in, in those days, it was very easy. I would have, we would observe license plates, meet their speeds, uh, measure their speeds, make a list, and then we could go to the, the uh, uh, RDV, it's called what, the, the institute uh, that that uh, that keeps track of the license plates, and we, we could get a printout of names and addresses and send them personalized questionnaires. No, nope. I think that is as good as impossible nowadays, definitely. Um, Ethics, uh, it was a lot easier. I think the GPR, the, the 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 privacy law has made has taken away a lot of the fun in doing research, doing a quick study. Uh, it definitely delays everything a lot. Sometimes you wonder why uh, uh, information should be protected this way. Uh, if I can observe, but to give an example, we we wanted, we were interested in crossing behavior of older people. And I submitted the ethics uh, form and they, they said, yeah, uh, do you really need to take footage of this? And I said, yes, because I want to measure how much time it takes and whether their gaze, where their gaze is directed and whether there are other things that need to be observed. I said, well, it would be a lot easier if you don't take footage because uh, the, then the ethics application is a lot easier. And I said, yeah, well, you're asking me to, to do 
inferior research now. And this is this is a, a really bad thing. And in the end, we found a solution for that. So ethics definitely uh, has changed, not only for the worse, of course, people are way better protected now. Maybe we were a bit too easy in the past, but uh, sometimes also hindering. Um, the the other question was the um, what was the type of uh, type of research, but it has changed. Well, I'm still a little bit surprised to see that the the first uh, study on automated behavior on uh, automated driving, the automated the the uh, automated highway system it called was called AHS. We did at the end of the nineties, and there are still people doing research on uh, <clears throat> the takeover requests and uh, take over time. So in, in that sense, it, it's still a lot of similar stuff that's happening, but there's also a lot of new stuff uh, happening, of course, because we had, who would have expected the uh, immense influence of mobile phones and the, the capability of that, of, of navigation. Look at how navigation devices have developed and how that has changed uh, uh, what information we can prevent and how, how much better that has uh, become. Type of research, research, well, research tools I've, I've, I've shown that they, they changed. Uh, research questions, well, sometimes they, they are similar, but of course new questions pop up with, with new, uh, for instance, like electric vehicles, you get new questions. So uh, yeah. it's a yes and a no. Okay, good. Thank you. So, any questions from the audience? It still looks very empty here. Ah. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm I'm quite interested in your studies on naturalistic cycling. Uh, like we had very little experience of that, but uh, it, it didn't really felt like we find anything interesting in that. So uh, do you have an, any kind of exciting finding what you found in your studies using uh, yeah, naturalistic cycling? Yeah, well, yeah what, I, what I just showed, the, the, it is, you get so much information uh, also, <clears throat> what what may lead to an accident. So, what I showed that the person entering the verge, we had another uh, condition where I also entered the verge, and uh, if that had gone wrong, it would have been marked a single sided accident. But what you could see from the footage is that preceding that moment, there were approaching cyclists, and this person was evading. Um, so and and well, we we never really thought about that. So you you can get a lot of more information from this type of uh, study. Someone breaking in. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, yeah. You know, we are very much interested in those like pre-accident measures. So yeah. Yeah, I, I, I really recognize. Uh, yeah. It is la it's laborsome and people need to keep a good track and you also need to look yourself for because people are not always aware of a situation that is that has been potentially dangerous yeah uh, yeah so it's very so explorative another important aspect you really need to to see what what is happening like you should not automate too much no no yeah yeah i think reen has a question Yes, yes, exactly. I, I saw it. So, Irene, please uh, speak up. Yes, thank you. Yes, Dick, uh, we know each other. We've seen, uh, we met each other. Uh, thanks for participation at this uh, webinar. I have a question about uh, ISA. Uh, you've been to uh, research on ISA. Um, what are the expectations of in the f future uh, of application of ISA? Um, should there be enough uh, compliance for the drivers? Or is it uh, still very uh, tough to, to, to implement it? Yeah, well, the, the major issue is, is acceptance, I think, <clears throat> and, and getting rid of errors. So uh, if, if you have a, a uh, restricting ISA, which is the safest, in, because people cannot speed, it's as simple as that. 
But they, if you have wrong information in the car, that is, of course, always a risk. Yes. And it can lead to new dangerous situations. Uh, so I think most of the, the, it will go more in, in the direction of being informative. And we have that already in many cars. You have the, the speed limit signs indicating and all these systems are getting better and better. And I think that is a, a, a good path to follow. Uh, but they may be a, a little bit more restrictive. Uh, in the end, you, one can wonder why can cars drive so fast anyway? There's, mm -hmm. uh, there are no roads where you can drive 200 kilometers per hour and also not in Germany, if you are sensible. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so yeah, a bit more restrictive. Uh, in the end, I think it, it will come. I think it will come. Yeah. yeah. In the first place at voluntary base, but in the next step, perhaps on more obligated. Yeah, it's a, yeah, yeah. 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 In, in general, you know, the people who need it most uh, probably will not follow it uh, by themselves. So they, they will need a more restrictive version. Okay. Uh, that's, uh, that's what we in general find, yeah. Okay, thank you, Dick. Thanks, Liam. Yes, I see another question from uh, Steffel. Please speak up. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the excellent session. I have a question about the psychological, psychological impact taking part to the some studies can have a very large target experience of participants. Of course, when participants take part to simulation studies, we do not expect them to experience any form of crash, but in case it happens, has there been any studies about the psychological impact those kind of experiences on simulation studies? can have on the drivers when they go back to real life driving experience. Thank you. So uh, you you were not that loud, but I think you're asking about the impact of crashes in, in simulations, uh, how that worked out, right? Yes. Uh, For example, yeah. in case participants, they can experience crashes during the simulation studies. Yeah. And is, has there been any studies about what psychological impact this kind of experiences in the simulation environment? And half when they go back to their real life driving, driving life. Not to my knowledge, no, 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 no studies performed as far as I know. But maybe I'm wrong. What I what I do uh, know that uh, in our driving simulator, if people get an experiment, uh, an accident in a um, experimental condition, that is, so it, it's not a demonstration where, where their, their, their peers are standing around them and having fun, then it's always nice. And But if it's a serious experiment, people don't like to get uh, accidents. It feels awkward and strange. Uh, and for that reason, uh, we should, again, as I said, try to avoid having this this uh, this in uh, experiments. What the, the after effects are, uh, as said, I don't know about any studies, I do, I do know that that um, uh, when I tested scenarios in the past, I was lazy. Then I, I, we had a manual shifted uh, a car, but you didn't have to press the clutch because it also worked without doing that. And uh, it was easier and fun. And when I then moved to my regular car, I, I really had to think about uh, so there's about pressing the clutch. So there is a, a sort of transfer. I would expect it to be there. But uh, hopefully not with crashes, no. People should not get used to that. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking it might be a similar, well, kind of related problem. If you uh, give people drugs, then how long time do you have to keep them from going out before you are sure that they are still not affected? They're already not affected. Well, that's very clear with alcohol. You know, you can you can breathalyze them, and we know we are not allowed to let people go uh, on their own uh, as long as they are above the legal limit. So we used to bring them home. The same with the drug study that I briefly showed about ecstasy. That was a fun study because people actually we didn't provide drugs there. They bought it themselves, and they bought an extra pill that they sent for analysis. And I would pick them up, and I would take them to the institute, and I would drive there, and I would. I would be a, a sort of taxi driver for them and bring them to a party where, wherever they, they wanted after the first ride in the simulator and then early in the morning where they could have used uh, more than one drug, not stimulated, but just the way they would regularly do it. I would 
try to find my participants, pick them up again, bring them to the institute, test them again, and, and bring them home. So they were not allowed to drive themselves. But I'm not saying they didn't do it, because some of them, I know some of them did. But they always did that. <clears throat> you will be surprised. In particular with drugs, it's similar to the, the medicinal drugs that I showed. Um, so, some of them have a... Uh, on a Sunday, you would not expect people to be drugged on a, on a motorway, but uh, Sunday uh, afternoon or morning. But there are plenty of people who go to a party and then uh, afterwards drive home and they mix among the, the families that are on the road right then. So these are things that happen, yeah. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Anya, you're muted. Yes, that, then then I don't write my name down. Um, yeah, um, I'd have a quite specific question in how you're doing the naturalistic cycling studies with the cameras at the moment. At the mo what what do you mean by, by how we do? We, what, yeah, what do you... it, when when you do the day, the the video collection and then you might get personal information so how, yeah. how are you doing the data protection thing well luckily we're, we're not having one running right now but we have we are in contact with a uh, uh, with NH nhl in uh, leeuwarden in friesland who are uh, computer guys i like to call them and they they have a software similar to google that blurs license plates and faces and, okay uh, that would be a way uh, to get it more easily ethically approved. Then again, I, I yeah, apparently this is a big problem to see people out on the road. I mean, if I see it with my eyes, it's okay. But at the moment it's research material, it's a different case. And I think these two are, are a bit too much separated. There's also an intermediate area where we are not out there to do harm, right? We are not out there to to to. Uh, we we care about uh, privacy and we honest. Uh, it's how sensitive is the information of seeing someone at a certain location out on the road? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. From practical, thank you very much. Yeah. From practical perspective, I totally agree what you are saying, Dick, but also I think it would be nice for us to organize a webinar with someone who dealing with ethical issues to kind of to hear their arguments. Yeah, the problem is that they're usually uh, legal people and they, they speak a different language and have a, a really different focus. And I find, communi I find communicating with them really difficult because uh, in many ways it is frustrating research now. And we get we get worse research as a result of this, and I wonder whether this is the price we really need to pay. But it's just my view. I'm just a stupid psychologist, of course. Yeah. <laughs> now I was in more in terms of uh, some professor in ethics or something like that because they really see the root of the problem. It's not about following the law, but like why does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I understand. Yeah, we've been too easy on this uh, uh, in in the past. It's true. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, our time is actually running out. We have just uh, one minute left. Uh, so any last chance questions? It should be a short one. Well, in this case, Dick, thank you very much for taking your time, for sharing all that experience. That was really interesting exciting a little bit nostalgic that's how yeah. it, i also remember those big diskettes so <laughs> i know how it works it was high tech at that time so yeah. nothing to joke about uh thank you very much and uh thank you very much the audience for staying with us so uh there would be a recording of this webinar available so uh, please share it with your colleagues if you are interested or come back and visit and listen once again. And hope to see all of you at our upcoming webinars. There are quite some in the pipeline. Okay. Thank you, Alexei. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.